Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be talking about the rise of low-code app development. Not only why it's going to have this huge, or it currently is already, having this huge impact on the tech industry and how it's going to have major changes, but also too, I'm going to walk you through a low-code platform called BlazePath so you too can start creating your application today. Before we go any further though, I want to say a big thank you to BlazePath for sponsoring this video. I've been talking to BlazePath and going through their product for weeks now, and I am obsessed. It's a huge game changer, so I'm really excited to be sharing it with you today. And I hope that you too can start using this application. If you are someone who maybe has a simple application and you know it's going to need to scale and grow as your team and uh, your company does too. And there are so many other possibilities with it. But before we get to that, make sure to hit the subscribe button for more tech and coding related videos. And I want to, as always, do a big shout out to some of these users here. Thanks for your support, your questions, all of the above. You all just rock. Okay, let's get started. Before we get into the tutorial though, let's talk a little bit about low code. Low code development applications typically require little to no coding and a lot of the times, or with BlazePath anyways, there is tons of different configurations so you can make it very personalized to what your company needs. Some of the benefits that low code offers include higher productivity, decreased costs, improved agility, and faster transformation. Also, I want to highlight a really interesting statistic that predicts low-code application building would gather more than 65% of all app development functions by the year 2024. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit more about BlazePath and my experience using it. When I started playing around with BlazePath, I quickly realized it's A, very intuitive, B, I love how there were different ways that you can import a project, and C, that it's so customizable. Prior to my experience with BlazePath, I haven't really done any low code or played with any applications that offer low code. And one of the things that BlazePath that really stood out to me is how customizable it is. I didn't realize though, I had this vision that because it was low code, it might not be as customizable, which in fact is completely not the case. What it is, is it's agile, it's flexible. Um, I also really like how when you're working in a team, there are standards put in place, you know, from the colors you are using, the text you are using, the layout of different systems, it's all standardized. So I think that will also make when developers are onboarding at a company uh, a lot smoother and a lot quicker. Okay, enough of me talking though, let's jump into the tutorial. Okay, I'm going to show you the application before I show you really how it's put together. So this is an example with Lost Pets, and as you know, I am obsessed with my dog, so this fits perfectly. If you go to Lost Pets list, you can see the different pets that are currently lost, including a squirrel, which I think is pretty funny. And you can also do a search and filter, so let's do this address here and say six miles. And then you can see pets or a pet that is currently missing around that area. And then you can also report a new pet here. You can simply put in your address and click convert to latitude. As well, you can put in contact info and a pet image. I'll choose a random pet image of a puppy. Okay, let's get started in Blaze Path. I've imported my project and you can see here in the drop down, this is called my workspace where the solutions are assets and extensions. Okay, now that I have my project imported, you can see here in the top corner, you can simply start by running your project. And then you can see down here where it says servers, you can see the web app microservice and DB. So you can simply launch the project from here or you can go to the console and see how everything is running. And you can access um, the address, which in this case is localhost from here. And once again, you can see our project of lost pets. Okay, and going back to how the application is broken down, you can see in my DB, that is where I stored all the info from the queries. And then we have the microservice to manage requests from the application. And the API itself, the details are in an extension, which you can see if you click the drop down, and you can see it's right there. It's an NPM library called Node Geocoder. And inside index, here is the function that returns the geolocation. So as you can see, it's not too much code. It's right from the NPM library we use and added our own into here. Okay, let's go back and take a look starting with the database and how that's set up. Let's navigate to MyDB. 
So you can see here, it has a very nice visual aspect, but imagine when things are more complex, how the diagram will look. Um, having something visual as a diagram is very helpful. And then if you go to reports, you can see here, I added in an ID, an address, you have latitude and longitude, contact info, image and distance. And you can see here, it's very easy to add a column and all the information you need for it. Okay, and then from here, if we go to microservice, and if you right click on it, you can see there's an option to generate CRUD API from relational database. And once you do that, I'm not going to click on it because I've already done it, but I'll show you what it produces. So we navigate to the API and under report, we can see that it made me the create, delete, get, list, all of the above. And it's really important to note that this is all generated for us. I didn't have to do anything. And I just added this get geocode info function because the API returns a list of the possible data. And in this case, I just want to get the first uh, possible entry. And of course, in a more full fledged API, there will definitely be more uh, transformations that need to occur. But in this simple example, uh, this is all I needed to do. And this is called from my web page. So go into web app and I'll pull up CMP home. And I really like how there's two tabs, one for design and one for logic. So you can see under design, it's just a basic web page right now, um, but there's so many different options of items that you can add from links, labels, icons. And then if I navigate to main menu, you can see here, it's just a JSON file. And you can see inside of it that, for example, to make a new report, all you have to do is call this component. Okay, and if we navigate to report new pet, you can see this is the design for the report new pet and simply you can customize or add HTML inside the HTML template. So I just got this from online. You can simply copy and paste it in or modify it. And I have this button down here, which has an event. So if we go inside logic, you can see under button click, and this button does two things. When you click the button, it opens the form component you can see here. And the second thing, when it returns an on okay event, this on okay event takes the model that comes from the form and it takes the dot instance binding value. And I will show you on the form exactly why this is. And then it just takes the report and sends it to the microservice and that adds it to the database and that's it. And when we go into the form component, you can see here it binds at instance dot address instance dot latitude instance dot longitude. You get the point. It binds whatever it is to the instance. So essentially when you get information from instance, you get all of it. And you can see here, convert to latitude. This is named button one. So when we go to logic, button one, and basically if the address is not null, then it will call the get geocode info. And from there, it will figure out the latitude and longitude. And it basically takes the latitude and longitude and sets it on the form. Also, I wanna show you the environment configuration, which is right here. So if you go into it, you can see that there, right now my database is a mock, but you could connect it to, for example, a SQL database. For this example, if you click on edit reports, you can see the different entries here where you can edit them, delete them, or add another one. Simply hit okay, and it would be added into your list. Also, I wanna show you, it's very easy to add in unit tests. So if you go into tests, there's a very basic test uh, example here. can see here, I just input an address and it's checking for latitude. So if you go under run, test, it will run some tests. And if you go back into the console, you can see test ex tests executed successfully. And it shows that my info.latitude has this information and it's the same information that I'm expecting. Okay, I also want to go over filter or the search aspect of it. So if you go to screens UI lost pet repeater, this is the actual search. And I want to talk a little bit about Outliner. Essentially what Outliner does is it nests UI controls that I am using. So in a more complex app, this is super helpful as you can visualize and see the different UI controls. And you can see here we are using a repeater that shows you the different cards. So as many cards as there are, it will continue to repeat. If you select the repeater, you will see inside the details part of it that it has a UI component called UI Lost Pet. And if I open it, you can see this is the individual card that will be repeating. Inside this card, the only HTML I am using is inside the HTML template and some properties to essentially center the card. 
And then if we go into logic under main init, when it starts, it calls for a refresh of the list. The button click does essentially the same thing. Uh, when clicked, it will do a refresh. And then we have repeater load records. And inside of here, we are getting the value of the address and distance, the text box one and numeric box one. And it stores it on an argument object and sends it to the method that does the actual logic. The method is located in the microservice system that you can see here, list reports by distance. Okay, so I did some UI updates to the Lost Pets application, and I'm just going to walk you through it one more time here. So you can see here we have the search. You can put in an address and distance and search for your lost pet. You can also report a new pet where you type in the address, convert to latitude, and type in your contact and pet image, similar to what we did before. And now you can see here, I'm adding in manually the latitude, longitude, and contact info. You can go here and put in new information. And those are really the main updates I made that I wanted to show you. Okay, let's get started on deploying the application. Okay, so now that we've seen the application I updated, I want to share with you how to build and deploy BlazePath applications in the cloud. So first, let's navigate to BlazePath. Click on Cloud Services. The first thing I want to note is if you look in the upper right-hand corner here where it says credits, you should automatically have received some credits from BlazePath. Plus, if you used my code Tiffin Tech, you will see more credits there. Also, if I navigate to usage, you can see here the dates and how much was actually used for the credits. Also, I want to take you to environments before we start and highlight that currently you can deploy to BlazePath environments or you can download the package to deploy on your own preferences. However, I do want to note very shortly here, watch out for some updates on BlazePath that will allow you to automate and deploy to third-party cloud applications. So stay tuned for that. Okay, now let's start getting into the actual deploy. To start with, let's navigate to repository. And this is where you will enter in your Git repository URL, as well as your user and password credentials to build and deploy your project. And next up, we need to configure the pipelines. And as you can see in the pipelines, they allow you to build and deploy, but also redeploy based on your last build. Let's navigate to build and deploy. And in build, you can see here that the branch is named main, but if you have a different branch name as you know, for GitHub, it uses main, but say you have something else, you can always do remove down or go to edit and edit the branch name as well. But in this case, I want main. Okay, next up, let's navigate to environments and in the application I shared with you or my application, it has a database. So we need to first create that database before we build and deploy it. Let's navigate to development and you can see I have mine already filled out, but I'm going to walk through the steps with you still. So next to relational databases, you can see I have one named Tiffin Tech DB, but for example, if I wanted to add a new one, I just click on that plus tab from here. You can pick a name. I'll pick, um, Tiffin Tech DB2. Also, it's important to know if you have an external database to check that off, but in my case, it's not. And you can see here it says creating, keep on hitting the refresh button every once in a while until you see it says, okay. Now that we have that done, let's move on to executions to actually build a solution. So once again, you can see I have been working in here and already have one. So let's navigate to start execution and right here, click on the search icon. So you can see here, I have my two repositories. I know in this example, I have double, but I wanted to show you the process I went through initially. So I'll select this one and select a pipeline, build and deploy. So from an execution, it will be from a Git repository that you selected and running a specific pipeline. It will then run and deploy from the environment you selected from the pipeline. And now we wait for a few seconds. You can keep on pressing refresh as I do when you're impatient to wait for the build to complete. Now that that is complete, we need to configure the deployment with a few different parameters. So let's go configure deploy. And you can see here in red, the areas that must be defined. Okay, first let's define the subdomain. So click on edit, and this is the subdomain that your final uh, project will have. So for me, when I was going through this initially, it was pet finder. I'll name this one animal finder. Next up, let's define the database, click on edit again, and you can see here the databases that I have created show up. And as you remember, it was database number two I created for this one. Also, I want to note if you forgot to create your database, you can still do it after the build. Um, I just find this flow to be much easier. 
And last up, I need a Google Map API key. And for this, I will not be sharing it with you, but you get the point. Okay, now let's go to resume execution. Okay, there we go. We can see success. As a reminder, always make sure to use the refresh button. And now let's go see our final product. So to do that, click on the two, or in your case, if it's your first time, it will be the one, and you can see a timeline. And if there was an error, you would see the error here. And you can see here under build one, you can download the generated source code or the Kubernetes deploy packages with YAML config files. And also I really wanted to highlight that there are no lock-ins with this platform. Okay, let's click on browse to view our application. Welcome to Lost Friends and there it is. And you can see here it's created by the subdomain you created, which in my case was Animal Finder, the environment you're working on, and then also to the name of your account. I also want to highlight, you can go back up to credits, refresh, and you can see with status of your credits, how many have currently been used as well. If you go back to usage, you can once again, as a reminder, see them all there. Also, if you go into environments, development, you can see here, now that we have everything up and running, we can see the cost per week if they were running 24 seven. And that is it. That is walking through the blaze path application and really how to use it. There is so much more to this application that I'm not touching on. I'm just wanted to walk you through some of the main features and highlights, and this is constantly being updated and improved. So I just think it's an absolute wonderful service for you to use. If you are someone looking for a low code solution, which as I mentioned at the beginning of this video is becoming more and more and will become more and more in demand and the way of the future. Thanks for watching. Make sure to hit that subscribe button for more tech and coding related videos. And I made sure to link everything down below. So go check them out.